Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the New Scotland Historical Society. It is the 26th of September, 2007, approximately 10 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My name is Wayne Rainsford, uh, born August 15, 1924, in Albany, New York. Okay. What was your educational background prior to going into service? Uh, 12 years of college. High school. Uh, high college. 12 years of high school. school. Uh, one year at a college in Vermont before I went into service. After I got out, went to Syracuse University, got a oh. BS degree in business. Okay. Uh, and uh, in the military, I also went to Lafayette College in the Army Specialized Training Program. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was a senior in high school, and the, one of the teachers brought in a recording of Franklin Roosevelt's uh, Declaration of War speech. Do you remember your reaction when you heard about this? At that time, I gave no thought of the military or what I knew slightly what was going on with the one lease program, and uh, but I uh, it was complete shock. I didn't even know where anything was in Hawaii, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, and so it at the time it hit me in one way, uh, but it didn't have the real meaning that ended up mm -hmm. the re end result. Mm -hmm. Now, did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted, but in a peculiar way, I, at, while I was at Green Mountain College in Vermont, uh, as a freshman, we had the opportunity to take a intelligent test uh, to go in the Naval V-12 program, and uh, they had to have certain IQs. I, in excess of Officer Scandate School, I know that. And I went up to Burlington, Vermont to take the physical and I flunked the eye test on the blue green. I was colorblind on blue green so I couldn't get in the program. So I was drafted in the normal way, but as soon as I got down to Camp Upton, they called, asked anybody that had passed the beat trial for the Navy program you were interested in the Army A-12 program or the Army Special Air Training program. And of course I jumped at the opportunity. Okay. Um, wh where did you go for that? Uh, we, we first, uh, to get into that, we had to take, take 13 weeks of basic training. Mm -hmm. at, where was that? In the Harmony Church area of Fort Benning, Georgia, which is the I understood the officers' candidate, the way they trained them for, uh, and it was a very grueling, 13 weeks. Okay. Uh, after that, they gave us the opportunity to pick what type of educational background we want or what we to uh, get into. We had a choice of engineering, pre-med, pre-dental, language, uh, weather forecasting, and, uh, and then they also assessed your experience. And mine was actually in accounting, which wasn't one of the uh, <laughs> opportunities, so I picked engineering, which I had no background in. And that's when you went to uh and Lafayette. I, I went, they sent me to, to Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, we, I think the semesters were broken down differently. I don't think it was as long as the college semester. Uh, and uh, this whole program, it was a very, very, a lot of disputes about it in Congress. A lot of the Congress did not want this program started. Uh, they thought we were going to be favored, and a lot of them thought that it was 
necessary for the future and to also keep the colleges in business because mm -hmm. they're all losing all the male yeah. students. Uh, it finally passed and the program was started and uh, after, I don't know, four or five months, whatever it was, they decided to close the whole program down. We were supposed to stay in college for the, for the remainder of our college education. And uh, they closed everything down. Uh, uh, people that got into this program were not only college students, it was uh, people from the Air Corps and officers saw the opportunity to go back to college. So a lot of them gave up their commissions and rank to get into this program. When they closed it down, it was one big fight. Uh, the, uh, they didn't, uh, the government didn't keep their promises. A lot of them told them they would go back to where they were before. They started to go back, and all of a sudden they'd get letters. Everybody was went to infantry. Everybody went to infantry, except the few, as I understand it, the few that had already graduated from college. Now, I have a friend that graduated from Columbia, who had already graduated, they kept him in at Amherst College to learn to speak Spanish. For what reason, I have no idea. But uh, there was very few of us that uh, remained in this whole program. There was actually 300,000 of us in this program. There's been a book which I have in my possession of about 300 pages on this whole program and what transpired in Congress and whole history of the thing. Now you had been in this four or five months? Yeah. It, four or five. How, how did you feel yourself? <coughs> uh, well, we didn't know. We had no idea. At least I didn't. Uh, at Lafayette, we uh, apparently some of the colleges were tipped off on this thing and they applied for other things which they were told they were going to get and didn't. At Lafayette, I didn't. I heard nothing about the program and we took, as a matter of fact, we knew at the time that this was just after uh, the, uh, the invasion of the continent, June 6th, and uh, we knew that they needed bodies, mm -hmm. and that was the reason we felt. Uh, there was rumors that some of the congressmen's son had flunked out of the program and this and that, but it was probably pure speculation. Uh, well, the main reason I think is they needed people to, uh, for replacements. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was fortunate to get into a division. Some of them, we didn't go in as a replacement. I went actually, and many of us in our, our college went to the 84th Infantry Division, which was a division that, as I understand it, was decimated with people that they had to discharge for medical reasons and other reasons, and about half the division was gone, with the remainder being mainly Spanish uh, people from the Southwest and Indians from the Southwest. And uh, so when we went down to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana, which was then the headquarters for the 84th Division, about half of us were from college, and the other half was, and who were the cadre, actually, were the remainder of what was left of the ones that were in the 84th to start with. We had no opportunity for advancement. Uh, the whole time, in either in the search service or overseas, none of the college people got any advancements whatsoever, either. The only way, a few of them later got battlefield commissions, but otherwise it was, everybody was, you had to, to be in the program, you had to go back to them. If they were in the service before, they had to go back to being a BFC. That's the way I understood it. Mm -hmm. anyway. What was your reaction to that? that 
it was it, it, it was our division, uh, among others, in the same situation it was highly dysfunctional. I think it was we were trained, well prepared, but there was always that resentment. Always it was there, and uh, it was two groups, and uh, it just didn't mesh. How did the other half the they, Native Americans they, Spanish from the Southwest Treaty? They didn't, uh, we were, they didn't want us there. Uh, we felt they didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, but that was, resentment was right through, at least for the time that we went into action. Uh, and. Uh, our, uh, our division uh, was green. We just absolutely, they threw us into the worst part, uh, right at the Holland German border, the Zigfried line. And, uh, when were you sent into combat? Uh, in the first part of November. We went so you, you went over just before the ball we, was We went overseas in. Uh, August, and we were supposed to be the first division to land on the coast of York directly from the United States. But we got hit by submarines out in the Atlantic and split up the division. Part of us went to one part. I went to when we went. Our ship went to Winchester, England. I mean, through the Southampton, but we ended up in Winchester, the old capital. Some of them went to two other different areas. England or Scotland or somewhere. So we got an extra month in England that we shouldn't have got. Uh, otherwise, we would have been directly right on the, mm -hmm. in, on the European continent. So we actually had 30 days of, of So where did you land on the continent? on uh, Omaha Beach, and uh, they took us directly by buses right up to the front, right into the, uh, close to the Holland German border. Uh, the, and we started action probably about the first uh, week of November. 1944, and uh, we had very limited action at the beginning. It was mainly uh, we got hit by artillery all the time, and uh, but we we weren't really advancing anywhere. Uh, one one I remember one uh, uh, instance that we got hit by artillery in this small village and we ended up in a tunnel, uh, a railroad tunnel, and they claimed at the time it was the highest artillery but battalion or uh, bombardment by the Germans that had ever been done so far. Uh, that was the rumor anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we were in the tunnel, it was seemed like a awful narrow small tunnel to me and uh, but uh, we come out with okay and uh, the from then on we went closer to the front now at this time we our division was actually attached to the English Army we we're in the ninth Army which was under General Montgomery and uh, they and uh, We ended up right on the border with, in our first action. We were supposed to, the plan was to take the, the Roar River, R-O-E-R, I want to emphasize, river in three days. And finally we found out after the war they didn't take it for three months. Uh, we, our first action right at border was right where the pillboxes were there and the landmines and the barbed wire and so forth and 
we were to take the village, well, they called it a city of Prumer, P-R-U-M-M-E-R-N, which was in Germany. Our regiment took the village of Kumarin uh, and dug in and built in the streets. And the rumor at that time, or the intelligence said that our only resistance would be from what they called the Volkster, which meant people's army and the older retired Germans that were desperate. And it ended up that we were we had a Panzer division, uh, a uh, tank division with infantry. Now remember that this is mid-November, 19th of November, two weeks before or three weeks before the bulge. We had no air reconnaissance because of weather. We had only three tanks, Sherman tanks, attached to our unit with English drivers. Uh, if it was mud, the tanks couldn't get through. Uh, we, they ran through, the tanks ran through the village where we were, and we were either, everybody was either killed or captured that we know of, except the back troops, the male and both and so forth. So your unit was overrun? Overrun completely. No, I, 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 no go ahead. Uh, I, me and another soldier were dug in in a foxhole right in the streets. Uh, before that, we had torched the city with incendiary bombs in every cellar, with grenades in every cellar, because Germans were hiding in every building. And uh, when we saw the tank division came come up into the village, I ran over and told uh, that the Sherman tanks were coming up to meet us. And I went over and told them, I said, there's is a whole tank division coming. And they were the big Mark IV or whatever, mm -hmm. monster tanks. Mm -hmm. As soon as the tanks saw their competition, they took off on us. But we had no, yeah. no tank support. The only thing that we could knock out the tanks was we had a bazooka. I understood. I didn't. I was not a bazooka. I was technically a scout. Uh, but I understand that at that time the bazookas were in two pieces. One person held one half, and the other was well, the other half, and nobody ever got together to shoot the tank trends off. So they came through. Uh, in the morning hours, a tank snow was right down our box, right over the top of us. What was left of us was captured, the whole group of us that weren't killed. I had friends that were killed. I had a friend from Troy, Peter Nugent, his father was a professor over at RPI. I saw him get killed. Uh, it was a, a slaughter. Uh, we had no, as I understand it, we had no reconnaissance that they, that the Germans were building up for the border, and this was the advance units of the Battle of the Bulge, which we, nobody knew was in this area. Some of our groups, well, I wasn't involved, we tried to take some of the pillboxes, and they had the difficulties. But uh, they, after we were captured, uh, herded back. Can I stop you for a second? What kind of weapon did you carry? M1. Mm -hmm. Now, as a scout, what were your duties? I was supposed to be the advance, but at that time we had no opportunity mm -hmm. for it. Uh, but we were supposed to go out and find the enemy. Mm -hmm. Now, this being November, did were you issued winter gear when you went in? Uh, I really can't remember. I don't know. We, all I know is we kept the same uniforms all the prison camp. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't have uh, an overcoat with you? or I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I, I think we did, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. The weather was bad. It was cold, uh, wet, rainy. Uh, the 
said we had no air reconnaissance, the tanks had difficulties. Uh, the, uh, the, we had no backup at all, as far as I know. Uh, the uh, uh, Germans hurt us, hurted us, and we had to march to the nearest city, which was Hanover, which was a big city. And they marched us through the streets in front of the public to show that they captured people. And we got stoned and bombed until they found out we were infantry. They thought we were Air Corps prisoners. And they resented the fact that the whole city was completely ruined. As soon as they found out we were infantry, they had somewhat respect for us. And Stop the throwing of the stones and harassment. And we ended up in a camp. I forget the number of it, but it was at a falling postal. Uh, F-A-L-L-I-N-G-S-E-S-T-O-O-L or something. Um, which was a temporary camp. Um, I can't remember how long we stayed there. I don't think it was too long. They put us into boxcars, overloaded them up to their ears. I, it, it, uh, took us to our permanent camp, which was in New Brandenburg, which was near the Russian front, near the Baltic Sea, in an area that hadn't been too heavily bombed. The city of New Brandenburg was quite uh, out of the way. and. Uh, we were in a camp outside. The camp held all nationalities. There were Russians there in one encampment. They divided the Canadians, they divided the English, they divided the Americans all into different compounds. Uh, they barracks, uh, I don't know how many to a barrack, probably a couple hundred to a barrack, I'm guessing. Three to a tier, straw beds, no heat, to except one stove up in the front, a small little office, uh, but it didn't heat the whole place. Uh, sanitary conditions were impossible. Food was Arizona's coffee, made of tree barks, uh, watered soup once a day, uh, no medical attention. At one time in camp, I, my head swelled up. I don't, had no reason to know why. They had no doctors except a so-called Serbian doctor. And uh, we, so we had no medical attention whatsoever. Uh, our All during our encampment, the, we got no mail from home, even though my parents wrote every day. Did you my, get my red, red Cross packages? Uh, no Red Cross boxes at our camp whatsoever. Uh, we did get the Red Cross. People came through with it in a cursory uh, uh, inspection, which did nothing. Uh, the, my letters that I sent, I guess we were allowed one a week or something, did get to my parents eventually. I have the letters home now. Uh, no, they were aware you were a POW? Uh, after a while, the mm -hmm. first notice they got, I had a letter that was missing in action. The second one was that of the prisoner of war. Otherwise, they had no idea where we were. We couldn't write in the letters. We were restricted to everything that we wrote. Uh, the Germans took them over first. And I had hope numbers, I had different things on, but I don't know if my parents understood them or not. But uh, I don't know if they got by the censors. While we were in camp, we, the German did send us out on work details. One time I was sent out to work in a brewery in the wintertime cutting ice. And well, we didn't cut much ice. But we got fed better because the Germans gave us all the beer we wanted. And 
hot soup and a little better feed. Uh, uh, another time they sent us out on a farm where we were supposed to work, and that was supposed to be more permanent. Uh, I remember a friend of mine was next to me, had uh, gangrene in his feet, and he it was extended through his whole body and died at the camp. The head of the farm was operated by French laborers. We couldn't trust the French. We didn't know if they were on the side of the Germans or the Americans. They told us not to drink the milk from the cows. It might be contaminated. We didn't believe anything they told us. We slept in the barns in the farm. Uh, that lasted, I really don't know, probably two weeks, a month, I have no idea, on the farm. All of a sudden, we got called back. Now, did you get special foods, too? Were you at least able the, to fa it? the farmers that operated the farm gave us better food than we had in camp, but it wasn't anything. Because they were starving at the mm -hmm. time themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the German soldiers that guarded us in the camps were 70 years old, most of them, and some of them were all across the front, but the older ones, a lot of them had sons that were prisoners over here. They knew they were well treated. Mm -hmm. They tried to keep us away from the SS troops. They tried to keep us away from any problems. And we were out in the field. Once in a while, SS Hitler youth came through. They kept us away from them. Uh, overall, we didn't know. We had no idea where we were, actually. Uh, and we, had, uh, we knew the name, but we didn't know where we were. Uh, all of a sudden, we were all called back to the main camp in New Brandenburg. And uh, while we were in camp, we heard the bombers go over every night. Uh, I think the Americans bombed by day and the English bombed by night. Uh, they were bombing on the Russian front in Stettin. And as the Russians got closer to us, we heard a small arms fire. We knew the Russians were close. Uh, the, our planes came over the camp every night, but they knew where we were apparently because they didn't drop any bombs, but we sure thought they were going to. Uh, the, I never seen too many American planes during the day, however. I don't know what, if they didn't bomb that, if the English only bombed at night, I have no idea. But uh, as the Russians got too close to us, apparently the German decision was to put us on a forced march towards the American front. We know no reason why, but they did it all over the country. It was on one of these forced marches for about two months, a month and a half to two months. Uh, on the forced march, it was 30 below most of the time. We either slept on the snow or in barns. The Germans wouldn't give us any. We didn't have any food. We had very little water. They wouldn't let us. I tried to drink out of a water hole on the road. They shot guns at me. They wouldn't let me drink it. Uh, the, uh, how, how, what did you have on? How did you keep warm? We didn't. We had nothing on uh, whatsoever. What uh, did you have on your feet? Uh, our, I think we still had our boots on. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them got frozen feet. I luckily didn't. Uh, I, my feet. I never showed signs of frozen feet. Uh, a lot of them did. Mm -hmm. uh, the, but we, as along the route, it was well over a month, maybe two. We got near, I don't know if it was the Elbe or the Rhine River to this day, but it was a bigger bridge than the one over the Hudson, I know that. And the Germans pushed one to just get across it. They crossed it. At that time, the Germans that were guarding us, the colonel was in a horse and wagon. They had no uh, gas whatsoever. All the gas was being used by, and, and they had no gas for the airplanes. They would use them for the tanks. We saw thousands and thousands of airplanes hidden in the woods of German. I think they had no uh, water or no uh, gasoline. Uh, we 
we got bound by our straight by our own planes all the time. We crossed the river on the airplane or on the bridge. Uh, after I crossed it, I run under the bridge. There was a young German soldier under there, talked English. I asked him, I said, how old are you? He said, 14. He was scared to death. I was, I was scared to death. I brought him. He didn't drift down. I got back to my own unit across there, which was we were still guarded by the Germans. Uh, we escaped from the Germans for a couple of days. Everything was in chaos. Finally, the Germans got near us again and told us either you get back to where you were or we'd be killed by our own small arms fire. Uh, so we went back, uh, and I vaguely, and I real to this day, I remember the food situation was so bad for us and for the German troops that the colonel and the upper echelon killed and ate their horse that night. Uh, that was the only food that they had. Uh, eventually, at, eventually, at that time, our 7th Armored Division came through. In this, well, we were in a small village. At that time, the Germans had taken off because they knew that the Americans were coming through. We talked the civilian population into putting up white flags and surrendering, showing signs of surrender, so they wouldn't shoot everybody in sight. Uh, just before that, we, while we were on the on the plane uh, on the uh, on the road, I remember being strafed for by our own planes all the time. We were mixed up right in the middle of a German troop uh, train, which was marked with Red Cross marks, uh, things, but they weren't Red Cross; they were German troops getting back. And we were strafed. Our, I, I, I jumped under the water on the small creek that was because the boats were spraying right on the back side of it. And, uh, but by the time we had talked the, get back to the village, we had talked the German people into putting out white flags. And eventually the 7th Armored came through. However, at the same time, we were right at the Russian front where the Russians were meeting the Germans. And at the same time, the Russians started straightening us. And our Americans threw down flags or things, identification marks on the ground to show that Americans were there too. But this was right at the meeting of the Russians and Germans, or the Russians and the Americans. And the only thing that saved us from being straight by, by the Russian planes was the flags that they dropped on the ground. Uh, after that, after we got liberated by the our armored division, we were sent back, I don't know how far, to a monstrous de uh, facility where things seemed a mile long, where all the POWs had gathered. They sent us through for de lousing, showers, new uniforms, and so it was an endless line that was going through. After that, they put us on C-47 planes uh, and send us that back to Lahar, which was Camp Lucky Strike, where we were supposed to go back to the United States. At the time we went back to Lahar, after we got there, they gave us the opportunity to go for a month in London, Brussels, or one other city in Europe, or go home. <laughs> well, you know the answer. We all went home. Uh, President Eisenhower, or General Eisenhower, came down to our camp and talked to us and asked us if we wanted to overload the boats and go home, if we'd be willing to do that to get home quicker. And we said, sure. 
And so I, when we got on the boat, we swept on outside one night and inside one night, back and forth till we got home. Uh, and I had a lot of souvenirs that I wanted to bring back, uh, guns and so forth. I had one of these, what we call Buck Rogers guns that the Germans had. And we couldn't, we didn't dare bring it home because they threatened us to, that we couldn't go back. And uh, uh, the, but and one another thing to mention too, while we were in the German house waiting to come home in the German after we got liberated we were in the mayor's house and we took that over and uh, they had no food but they claimed they had no food but we went down in the cellar and they had one of these cisterns down the cellar which was full of eggs where they cradled the eggs or whatever they do to them they had food up to their ears hidden there uh, but uh, we didn't bother them, and they didn't bother us, uh, even though we had control of the whole place. We worked well with them. They, there was nothing else they could do. Uh, and on the boat coming home, uh, we passed the Statue of Liberty, and we were so excited that we all run to the one side of the boat, and the boat tipped so much that we were warned to go back on the other side of the boat to make it even. But it was one hell of a thing to see you know, the Statue of Liberty again. And we were greeted by the usual boat, the tugboats with the bands and the, all this stuff, uh, and everything else. And uh, by that time, we had been issued. Uh, we all, in, before I when I before I got on the ship, I had trained. They had given us new uniforms the Eisenhower jacket, which we knew at the time. We were one of the first ones that had it. And uh, one of the group that was there had uh, these parkas that were came that came from the uh, ski troops, and it was a beautiful jacket. So I traded my jacket for this thing, which was out of the exception. And so I wore that back, and as soon as as soon as we got back, they, uh, well, I should mention too that they didn't dare feed us too fast at Camp Lucky Strike because of the deteriorated condition we were in. We lost enough water weight. How, how much weight did you lose? Did I didn't you know? lose as much as we did. I probably lost 20 or 30 pounds, mm -hmm. uh, but most of them lost a lot more than that. For I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the reason. But they fed us very slowly and checked to, to see if we wanted to put in any complaints against any of the Germans and so forth. Most of us didn't. We didn't give a damn, but we didn't want to just want to get home. Uh, even though we could have turned in some of the names. Uh, we were mistreated mainly by the soldiers that came off the Russian front. Uh, they were vicious, but the older guards kind of prevailed. So that's general story on that. And as soon as we got back, we got re-examined uh, by uh, the doctors until it came out of our ears. And I remember the story of one doctor, and he, as soon as he saw the jacket I had on, he wanted that in the worst way. And he says, I'm not going to pass you until you <laughs> trade this jacket. And I said, no way. And I kept this jacket through college and everything else. It was out of the ordinary. But it, <coughs> after got, we got back, they gave us uh, 90, I think it was 90 days furlough, and of which they sent, besides coming home, they sent us on what they call now rehabilitation, re whatever they call it, R&R, &R, sent us to the Lake Placid Club, which was one of the most exquisite countries and uh, clubs in the United States, a private club, and we were there for two weeks with everything you could imagine. I actually brought up my wife, and my uh, my girlfriend, my now wife, who was still in high school. She spent a week up there, but it was 
English tea in the afternoon at the club, and use horseback riding, boat sailing, anything you wanted to do. It was just unbelievable. And uh, so after the we got through with that, it was a month. They, or of course, was still going on in Japan, and they said, "Well, you're going to stay in the military." But we got to decide what to do with you at first. So they can't send us over to Camp Miles Standish at Taunton, Massachusetts. The war was over by that time in Europe. And uh, we, so they put us in the military police at Camp Taunton uh, to guard the Germans as retribution. The German POW camp there, mainly with submarine people in there who got captured during the early part of the war. Other times we were on town patrol and we were up in the towers guarding the Germans who didn't want to leave anyway. And uh, it was, and we worked with the police in the area of Attleboro, Taunton, Brockton, Massachusetts stopping all the hell raising that was going on by the troops coming back. Every bar was filled with Air Corps and infantry fighting with themselves and so forth. And it was a, it was just a, it was something different. Uh, the, um, uh, and I will mention too, I, at the time, uh, I was home on a furlough with one uh, at one time, and a friend of mine I went to Green Mountain College with lived in Upper New York State, and he asked me and said, "Do you want to go up to Mount Marcy for the night and try and uh, go up Mount Marcy?" And I said, "Sure." And this was in August, and. Uh, we went up the mountain. By the time we got back, the, the Japanese had surrendered. We didn't know they had surrendered until we got back. And uh, so uh, eventually in December, I got discharged uh, and came home. And uh, I couldn't get in college. and I would, in, Genu in the January semester at Syracuse University, and I had to wait till May and got in. And I had th three years of college, which I took in two by going year round, and uh, uh, I graduated with a BS in business. But most of my thing was in the my courses was in the graduate school at Maxwell School, which was graduate economic school. And uh, took a job after graduation with Dun & Bradstreet and done investigation of businesses with my background in business and accounting of uh, major businesses, publicly owned company as well as problem cases in New York, Massachusetts, and Vermont. And uh, I had no problems at all with medical until 1974, and I started to get panic attacks. And I found out since that most of our prisoners in our group in northeastern New York had the same problems. And it came on me, and I couldn't even travel within a 30 mile radius, or I would go berserk. Uh, it started being in a, I was coming home one night from northern New York, I got a haircut in the Mohawk. Hotel, which is now the Schenectady County Community College in Schenectady, to get a haircut. And they put their robe over me to get the haircut, and all I wanted to do was to get that robe off and get out. It was that was the start of the panic attacks, and uh, I was treated by all types of medicine at the veteran at the VA hospital as well as on many med and uh, nothing seemed to work until one POW from Del Mar told me that they had experimented with him with Paxil. I took it and immediately I got rid of the panic attacks but today I still have anxiety and uh, I do get uh, you 
credit for PTSD. Technically now I'm on a 100% disabled, which every group, one in our group has now, one way or another, as a result of what they call presumptive disabilities that we've had since that they can't prove where they came from, but they have to presume that we got them while we were in the military. One of mine is peripheral neuropathy in the legs, another was heart condition, PTSD, and so forth. And, uh, uh, and uh, we were consider I considered it fortunately to get the 100% disability, which gives us a lot of benefits with our spouses and uh, compensation now. So that about ends it, I believe. I, I had to resign from my position early in 1974 because of the panic attacks. And uh, uh, the, uh, so I, I believe that's the end of what Okay, on, on the march of the, the POWs, did, were the Russians and the Canadians and the English included in your march? Not in my group. They were separated? Yeah. Okay. Um, were you ever aware of the concentration camps, existence no, of them? Definitely not. Mm -hmm. Definitely not. Uh, I knew we had Jewish, a lot of Jewish uh, in our division because they were in the ASTP mm -hmm. program. And uh, I had a good friend from Albany, Cal Rabinow, who got captured the same day I did. And at New Brandenburg, they separated him and put him into what commandos uh, separated him. And they were treated substantially worse than we were. Uh, I uh, haven't, I, he's in California now, I haven't heard from him at all. But I did get uh, this letter from the Jewish uh, one that was in our division from Florida that sent me information about what the Germans had written about us uh, in the camps, our names and addresses and so forth. And uh, I believe he put in a protest uh, what the results were, I don't know. But uh, they did separate it at the camp. Now, President Roosevelt's death, were you, did you hear yes. about this at all? Yeah. Yes. We heard rumors in camp. Uh, but we never know if they were real mm -hmm. true or not. Uh, uh, our camp didn't seem, we were isolated. As I understand it, during the war, New Brandenburg was never bombed by our planes. It did get overrun by the Russians and everybody was slaughtered there. They were treated bad. I tried to go on the internet and uh, I found things about the city, but I haven't been able to dig into the camp or mm -hmm. what happened yet. Uh, the, uh, but uh, the rumors, we heard rumors all along, and but that Roosevelt died, yeah, we had it mm -hmm. pretty quick. Now you uh, obviously use the GI Bill for your college. Yeah. Did you ever use that 5220 club? You said you were unemployed or didn't start college right away. Did you use that at all? No, no, no. We, we got paid while we went to college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's I was just wondering if you thing. used it before you no, went to college. No, I, I went to work. I took a temporary job with the state uh, audit control department uh, during nights, and we were setting up their preliminary to their computer system. and. Uh, we found ways of beating the machines, the IBM machine, where we actually, actually we had two college kids, the other kid was going to Cornell, I was going to Syracuse. We'd done work for the Department of uh, Audit and Control, we did, did the work that eight girls were supposed to do during the day, we did two hours every night and just slacked off the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah. By, screwing around with the machines. Now you, you uh, belong to the uh, POW group. Do you belong to any other veterans organizations? No. no. Okay. Um, I, I belong to DAV, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, how do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? 
I am proud of it. But with the panic attacks that I got, it destroyed my 20 or 30 years of working probably afterwards. I had worked for 25 years and I got a pension, small amount. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, I, I still get rated for PTSD because I do have anxiety. As I told you, I uh, had this thing the other day where they thought I asked mm -hmm. me in front and I, I just uh, started to get excited. I had to cut it off. But, uh, uh, and I still feel anxious. Uh, I still take pills for it, too. Mm -hmm. Now, did you receive a Purple Heart also? Yeah. No. No. Oh, okay, no. I wasn't sure if Brown I saw Star, that on your... No, no, no. Okay, so I didn't know if I saw that in They will go together, go together, but they... Mm -hmm. Did uh, many uh, of your group die in captivity in your... Uh, not, camp? not that I know of uh, in my group. I didn't know. No, I, uh, not, no. Uh, of course, I was a prisoner for six months. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of them were there for three and four, five years, four years. I, in our group, there was some that were captured in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, half of our POW group is Air Corps and half is infantry, I would say. Mm -hmm. Now, did you bring any pictures with you? That you, uh, you have your POW. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's got the medal and uh, his dog tags. Okay. Now, what is this one? That's the German POW. Yeah. That's yours That's from when you were ID ID in Germany. The number just like ours. Okay, got it. And what was that? It was given to German women for having extra kids, as I understand it. Really, on it is the German mother. German mother. And that was in the back, you'll see it's 1938 before we got into action. Yeah, now, where did you get this? Stole it out of the mayor's house. Oh, okay. Should I put that in there? <laughs> yeah, we, you know, we had the opportunity. You liberated it. You didn't steal it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was, yeah. But we had the opportunities. I mean, our POWs were right there. And, you know, and I understood our camp was right near either where they had built the first so-called jet airplanes, or they had this underground facility, this thing that's been well written up. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it at the time we were there, but uh, I read about it afterwards. It had to be right close to us. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Well, it's, it's